Today I'm joined by Rafi Tross, who recently won the SETI Ford Award from the SETI Institute. Welcome to the show, Rafi. Good to be here, Martin. Rafi, the SETI Forward Award is about SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, right? That's right. Yeah. Together with my advisor, Steve Croft, I searched radio frequency data from the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia to find radio techno signatures, and I used Google Cloud to do it. Excellent. Can't wait to hear more. You said techno signatures. What does that mean? Right. So it's a distinguishing between natural emission sources and artificial sources. Natural sources being stars or galaxies or anything out there in space and artificial being from a technological civilization like Earth. Got it. Uh, it's my understanding that a galaxy can generate a lot of radio noise and collapsing black holes and quasars and things. And they can be very loud. So how do you pick out these weak artificial leaked signals from this sea of very loud natural radio noise? Yeah, that's a good question. So natural signals, we expect them to be spread out in frequency, but not stay around for very long. But technological artificial signals, we expect to be very narrow in frequency, but stay around for a long time because they're tech they're communication signals. So we expect them to stick around a lot longer. Looks like frequency is on the x-axis and time is on the y-axis. I feel my old math classes may become useful again. So if we can do a Fourier transform on the radio noise, we can see if any frequencies stick out? That's right. In principle, that should be perfect, like in the books, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. There's lots of signals from Earth, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, anything that we get from space looks exactly similar to all of the signals that we want to get from extraterrestrial civilizations. Oh, right. So is it possible to filter out all that Bluetooth and GPS and all that? Yes, it is. But my first thought would have been that you can filter them out based on what they look like in the graphs. But like I said before, they are almost identical. So we have to go by different means. And that's by we do this by changing how the telescope looks at the object. And so we observe in a way in which we look at the target of interest, then we look away from it, and we try to localize which signals are from space and which ones are from Earth. Got it. So in the top panel here, we're looking at the target star. And then in the second panel, we look away from the star. Uh, and the idea is that microwaves and garage door openers and all that stuff, that will appear regardless of whether we look at the star or away from it. That's right. So the telescope can, is only in one position. It can't move. And whatever signals from Earth are hitting it right now, we're probably going to be hitting it at a later time, too. And so we can reasonably expect that all the signals that, are, that we see when we're not looking at the target will stay there for the, throughout the entire observation. Got it. And a minute ago, you said that this was simulated data. Do you have any real telescope data that you can show us? Certainly. So here are three plots that we have of real telescope data. Uh, the leftmost one shows a signal that's pretty coherent throughout the whole thing. And so we can reasonably deduce that this is most definitely terrestrial because it shows up in all the observations. In the middle one, we can see that it's not very coherent. And this is an artifact of our signal processing software, TurboSETI. And this is an artifact of it because it's clearly not a coherent signal like the first one. And so this is just a problem with TurboSETI. This is an example of where the program does exactly what we tell it to do, but not exactly what we want it to do. Um, and on the right side is another example of terrestrial interference. And it's because of the certain, we expect certain terrestrial sources to look like these in graphs. And so we just identify it as, inter as terrestrial interference. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, I think I get the theory now, uh, but how does all this work in practice? Uh, how do you actually get the data from the radio telescope? Yes. So the telescope does its thing. It looks at the sky. We collect the data. We save the data in three different formats for three different interesting science projects. And so I look at the fine frequency resolution data products. And this data is in filter bank format. And these files are each on order of 
uh, gigabytes. And for certain targets, the telescope uploads that data to a Google Cloud storage bucket. And then people like me come along who want to process this data. And we go into Google Cloud, and we operate on the buckets themselves. And and how does that work? The, the files are in Google Cloud Storage. Uh, and uh, what do these files actually contain? Yeah, these files contain anything that landed on the telescope, any photon that landed on the telescope while we were observing. Um, and so the radio sky is pretty full, and it's pretty noisy. But there's a certain section of radio frequencies that is actually pretty quiet at. And so we observe at these frequencies. And this is around 1 to 11 gigahertz. And so each filter bank file contains all the data we find while we're observing that. And each file has a resolution of 3 hertz because we're looking for a narrow band signal. So 3 hertz resolution is pretty good for what we're going to be looking for. Got it. Uh, so now these files are on Google Cloud. Uh, how did you process them? Yes. So I used uh, virtual machines from Google Cloud Platform. I installed on each of them the program that we use, TurboSETI, and then pointed each of these virtual machines to different files in the bucket. They do their thing. They process for about a week um, and tele process about 58 hours of telescope data, and which a week sounds like a long time, but it's much faster than previous studies had. Got it. Uh, so the limit here is not actual radio telescopes. It's a computing power? Yes. So that's what makes Google Cloud Platform that much more interesting. So we can process a lot more data uh, than if we would have done it just on disk on your regular laptops and such. Right. Uh, OK, so you ran the Turbo SETI software on this data for a week. Uh, what What is the output of the software? Yes, the software goes through each of these filter bank files that we're talking about and searches for hits, which are signals above a signal to noise ratio of 10. Um, it's arbitrary that we choose 10, but previous studies have also chosen 10. So it makes comparing our results that much easier. And so we expect that a lot of these hits are terrestrial interference and not anything of interest. Got it. Uh, did you get any hits uh, that weren't obviously from Earth? Uh, I really wanted to. Um, I didn't get any hits, but uh, you'd be the most famous person in world history if you did. Right? I know. I know. <laughs> um, yeah. But during the summer internship, uh, there was an intern who did find something pretty interesting on a different telescope and different data. and. I remember the meeting. It was it was pretty cool to watch because uh, he just comes up and says, "I think I found something," and like it's all everyone freezes. Every, all the experts are huddling close to the cameras, trying to get a really good look at what they're looking at, and then uh, everyone just goes onto a different call because we need to figure out what this thing is. Is this what is this? And it turned out that unfortunately they ruled it out um, from being what we wanted to be in extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, but it did actually start a good, like, how are we going to, what do we do if we find a signal that we can't explain? Right. I mean, yeah, in the movies, it's all a conspiracy theory and it's <laughs> very cut and dry, but I guess in real life, it's not so simple. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish it was like the movies. It's, it's much simpler. <laughs> uh, so what do you think is next for SETI? Yeah, so it's, it's in a pretty exciting field right now. Um, there's still a lot of sky to look at, and we see, well, on this graph here, this is just the sample of stars that uh, we believe, we have good evidence to suspect that they host Earth-like exoplanets, which inherently make them interesting uh, SETI targets. And so the red ones are the ones that I looked at, and all the blue ones are ones that we haven't looked at. And this is an ongoing study, so that's I'm excited to see the results of that. There's also searching the million nearby stars. There's also searching uh, 123 nearby galaxies. So it'll be the first search for extragalactic civilizations. After. So I'm excited to see those results. Wow. Uh, and what are your personal goals, Rafi, after now that you've wrapped up this project? Yeah, my personal goals are, so I'm going to be starting graduate school for a master's program uh, at DePaul University. And after that, I'm hoping to um, enroll in some sort of PhD program. But as a career goal, um, I want to help 
the Philippines. So I was adopted when I was two and grew up in the U.S. And all my life, I've, I've wanted to somehow give back. And the way I can give back is somehow using my expertise that I hope, hope to gain. And so I hope to help the Philippine Space Agency, which was founded like, like four years ago. So I hope to help them with their natural disaster monitoring and other space-based assets that will improve the quality of life. Cool. Uh, thanks for uh, joining me on the show, Rafi. Can't wait to see what uh, what you do and what happens with extraterrestrial intelligence and, and your uh, personal aspirations. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for watching. If you have any questions for Rafi or me, please let us know in the comments. And if you have any requests for cloud computing topics we should bring up in future episodes, please also let us know below. I read every single comment. Until next time. Thank you.